So hello everyone. Uh, people call me Sebastian. And online you'll probably find me as Private Seabass or just Seabass. People call me both things really. So um, today I'm going to be telling you guys about the, the data that companies have about you and where that data came from. But first I'm going to ask you this. What do you think, what do you think they do have on you, right? Lots. Shoe size. Okay, but just give me just give me some examples of things. They know I like airplanes. Oh, oh, okay, all right. They think I'm married. <laughs> that's that's a good one. They think I was born in 1907. That's quite a time. All right. <laughs> okay, and uh, otherwise, um, I'm going to ask you guys what you guys tend to hear because I know a lot of us in here do care about privacy to some degree. What are the kinds of things you hear when you sound like a nut because you're into privacy, but you're telling them these are the things that I care about? What do they tell you in response normally? Okay, nothing to hide. Anything else? They just don't care. Just don't care, all right. Say again. Even though there's a huge amount of crosstalk between all of these uh, people who are harvesting data, people generally don't care because of what it offers. Okay. So don't care because they get such great value out of it, okay. So the most common thing I tend to hear is something like, eh, they have my data. There's nothing I can do about it. So what if I continue using the same thing? And by the same thing, I would mean use the same data, keep identifying themselves, giving more information. They'll ask that. It's all metadata, right? It sometimes is. It's all it's all anonymized, right? Yeah, yeah. So, my response to this usually would start with something like, "Well, you know, these companies don't need to be sharing this information about you. They can use it themselves, but they don't necessarily need to be trading it and making it public, essentially." And Further on that, right? I, I realize that they already have it, but that doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. That doesn't mean that you can't recover some of your privacy just because you've lost some of it here. There are other ways of getting it back. So that's generally what my presentation is going to be on because this is somewhat like what we're preventing. <laughs> so you know, a large amount of the time, the ways that they may end up getting data, and I'm going to start with like how a single person may obtain your data, because it's public, it's not too hard to get, and when I say it's public, there are people search engines, and those search engines will give you, based on you giving them a name, they might give you something like an email address or a phone number, all of which, if you go to a new service, may give you another of a different kind of data about that person. So very easy way of gathering it, a lot of it, quickly. Yeah, we make a scraping utility. So we call Python, we say search for this type of, this set of letters or numbers, in which case would be like a phone number, be like an email, maybe a social security number, depending on where they're scraping it from. And uh, from there, those tend, to get those tend to be combined into OSINT utilities. Again, this can be used by either a general person, but if it's an OSINT utility, now we get more into the business side of it because people have made businesses off of creating these utilities for people. Similarly to how Metasploit was created for giving people many tools for hacking, we have something like Maltigo, which is great for obtaining large amounts of information on, general, on the general populace based on whatever data we previously provided. So the various methods that it might be obtained for, say, a firm or a company, someone who's trying to purchase it, right? The government is one place that you might be able to obtain it. I have a link on here. It's small. I'll have the slides posted sometime later so you can go take a look at it. But basically what it's describing is some some state's government official officials, some some authority had sold um, about fifty nine thousand dollars worth of private data. Now, okay, it's not exactly private data because 
it is in public record because it is voter data. Because voter data is public data. If you put down your address on there, your name, uh, your affiliation to which side you would prefer, that is technically public data. One site you could see that on, I believe, is called voter, voter registration, voterdata.com, something similar to that. You can search it and find that. However, they sold it. I'm not certain what makes what they sold special. But now we have government also selling what would otherwise be private data. We can look at utility companies for how they're gathering data and then selling it. We can see that most houses these days have like a smart electrical meter. And that meter, the power company will be taking information about the amount of power consumption at the house, be it at a given time or with, uh, with certain other anomalies that it may be able to detect. Great, it might be, they might be able to provide a better service with you that way. You can go online and see graphs about how your power is being used and maybe manage it better at home that way so you have a lesser power bill. OK, so that's there. But the problem that comes out of that is when we have a neighbor who wants to know what the neighbor's phone or uh, electric bill is, we have the ability to ask for that. And it may be provided for to us if we um, de depending on the method of asking for it. Similarly, why might we want it, right? Because, OK, we're, we've obtained it, and that doesn't necessarily mean we can do anything great with it. It's just my electric bill and kind of how it's been used over time. If I know someone who lives in some neighborhood and I can obtain how their electricity is being used throughout the day, I can tell with relative certainty when they're at home, when they're not at home. If I'm deciding this is a house I want to rob, I'll take that information, say they're probably not going to be around at this time. And by the past months, as how that data would probably be provided, I can tell they're probably not there. Great time to rob a house, isn't it? The last one I would be going over would be your banks. I'm pretty sure you can opt out of this one. I'm not certain if it's all of it, but uh, there is an opt-out portion in most banks, as far as I'm aware, for not uh, letting them sell your information to marketing companies or distribute it to third parties in some way. And where I can see that this, where I can say this has had use for companies is mostly insurance companies. If you have a really nice policy, because I don't smoke, I, I don't drink either, but then I, if I were to go over to this store which sells cigarettes and which sells alcohol, uh, and I'm not necessarily getting it for myself. There's a party that's going on. My friend asked me to purchase it for them because they don't have the time right now. And you're obliging. You make the purchase. If it is an alcoholic at an alcoholic store, if it's at a, if they can identify that you purchased cigarettes, well, now our insurance company is kind of suspicious that that policy still applies to you. Should you be having that policy if you're smoking and drinking? Well, to be fair, we're doing things genuinely, right? So we probably wouldn't be, and we're probably actually getting it to people as they should. There's great use of it for insurance companies. However, it causes problems with us who are trying to do nice things for others, even. So. The last method that I will be going over, and I'm going to be talking more on this afterward, is what if you just collect the data yourself, right? You set up a company, and that company has uh, tools in it which would allow people to set up like APIs to gather data. And you get some of that data, be it be like what most people's computers are, or maybe their accounts information based on whatever you're using. Um, clear answer for how they're doing it, right? I mean, we have our API. How they're not getting my data, they're pulling it out of a hat. They're, where are they getting it from? And a quick example for it is if we were to look at Discord, right? That's a chat client that was made for mostly gamers, and it does pretty well. It lets you make servers, it lets you talk with 
pretty great clarity. And in fact, it, I'm pretty sure it's based on the open source software called Mumble, which in itself is really clear. But the difference being, this one has an AI of some kind that it uses to dampen chewing sounds. Because who wants to hear your friends chew as you play video games, right? So the main question that I would end up posing is it's, it's a free service, free software, and we can make as many servers as we want. We can have pretty great permissioning on it. How do they pay for it? Any guesses? OK, so, so it's in selling data. All right. Now, what kind of data do you guys think they would be selling? They're listening to how you chew so they know what kind of snacks to sell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, I, you know, I didn't think of that directly, but that is a very good possibility. <laughs> if you get textures of the sound, you can figure it out. <laughs> Say again? If you can figure out the textures of the sound, you can get a general idea of what is popular amongst a certain type of uh, consumer. What they're really going to ask or looking for is what games you're playing, and they're going to market games that statistically you're more likely to play that you haven't talked about. That's what they're going to, they're going to sell it to GameStop. And, and when you Google whatever, they're going to target your ad with that. And that's, they read every bit of text that's there and do a lot of speech to text um, and, and AI processing, if you will, somewhat like Alexa. And their API allows you to link other programs, so Spotify, yep. Music, yeah. stuff like that. So, you know, that, that goes over a large amount of what I was planning on saying about it, so thank you guys. <laughs> Um, well, it's, and, it's and the one, same as, as Google and your mail, right? Your yeah. Google mail line. Gmail is a great service, as long as you're willing to understand that they're reading every line of the non-PGP email that shows up in your inbox to turn it into marketing data. And on that, right, to further the point on that, they didn't start off selling video games, right? They now do, and with the amount of data that they get from gamers, it is a desktop application. Because it's on your desktop, they can see the things you're playing and or other software you're running even. So with that information, it's great for marketers to determine what kind of stuff, whatever demographic the people say they are, are using. And when it's time for a processor <laughs> Well, if they, only if they complain about it. <laughs> can, they, can they do a, a software audit and turn you over to the BSA? Well, <laughs> First question, what is a software audit? So look at what software you're running on your system. And if it's proprietary and licensed, check and see if you've got a license code. And the BSA, not the Voice Tabs of America, the other evil organization, the business software alliance, Microsoft, Apple, <laughs> Adobe. Um, but they've known to use FBI agents to knock on doors and ask about license code. So that's one possibility. They could possibly sell information like that to them even. There is a significant reward for turning people you get ads for it on Facebook all the time. For, for this sort? No, for what he's talking about. Oh, for uh, software. Yeah. Illegal software? It's so it's illegal software. If you find it, there is significant rewards. Mm -hmm. There's just some idiot in the server room that's like, this is their example. So, you know, one thing that you could end up asking as well, how did they start off with it? OK, maybe based on Mumble. But as far as I'd read at one point, it is based on, uh, it was created with millions of dollars from investor funding. They are probably getting it back based on how expensive that first investment was. And they're, them still being alive, I should say. So the other company that I'll bring up, Twitter. Because tweets sync fleets. Um, with what? So Fitbits. Fitbits do too. They'll, I mean, they'll make maps for you, right? And that's quite nice. It's just Have you never found all the special operations bases. I was going to say. All over the <laughs> because guys go running with their Fitbit? Yep. I mean, they're required to go running, right? So why not just see how well they're doing with the Fitbit? So in the tweet seeing fleets sense, that one is much closer to the uh, open source intelligence gathering thing that Maltigo might be doing. If someone puts up their email and has it public, we have the person's email, we may have the person's name, and 
we can also create uh, utilities to scrape through a bunch of accounts for if we decide we want to get, gather more data at a faster rate. Maybe more, maybe more accurate, maybe less, but point is you have the capability of doing it. Similarly, if you are a data scientist and you want to see how various types of demographics communicate, if you just take all the text you find on Twitter, then data scientists will have a very easy time using some form of machine learning, most likely, and say, this person is likely a 13-year-old uh, girl. This person is likely a 52-year-old man, because they simply talk differently, and even on different subjects. With enough of the information, you can create AI, which is relative with you know, good enough accuracy able to determine what kind of demographic you are. Maybe target them with this misinformation. You might be able to. And in fact, I do know of people who write things differently on Twitter just to get around that issue, yes. So you could. You probably could. So otherwise, you know, I, I'm going through the various methods of how they might be obtaining it. And I was on government jobs earlier and went through their privacy policy because I actually read these things. Now, this one might be just fine, but to get an idea of the kind of information that I would be searching for is, we process information for background check services. OK, that's, that's fine, right? It's a police department. They probably need to do that because we don't want the wrong people being our police officers. We go further in, say, data may include URL, include a URL to the full background check, or to the full yeah, background check report. We might want to see it. Current state of the background check report, pending, cleared, review, whatever you'd expect. We may send name, zip code, phone number, employment history, education, email address to facilitate the use of the background check company. OK. And I'll say maybe that's all justifiable. The thing that I end up wondering is if we have a company like Intellius or True People Search, how do we know that they don't have all of the information about us already? Because that is. You can pay a little bit for it and get a full background check on someone. So if they don't have all of our information, but everything else is accurate, I've heard of them just adding it to their database. So now we've got more information that the government may or may not have intentionally put onto a public database where, you, where others can find out about you as well. LexisNexis, man. Yeah, LexisNexis. I'm going to go into that later. <laughs> so. You know, maybe it's legitimate, right? I, 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 I will be perfectly honest. Don't totally know the answer to it, but it's something I look for. Similarly, if you were to look at Backblaze, how do you? So this this article was in two thousand nine, right? I know storage was more expensive at that time, and let's say someone had a two hundred fifty gigabyte Macintosh. How expensive do you guys think it would be to back up? that much data, meaning 250 gigabytes. How expensive do you think it would be to even get the hardware for it? It would be at least 70 bucks. OK. Define, define getting the hardware for it. Uh, you're, fair enough. I should say uh, getting something like the hard drives for it. $10, for $10, $10. 2009? $10. 2009. Okay. was probably fifty to seventy-five dollars. Yeah. Yeah, fifty bucks. But it was two dollars and ninety-nine cents from Apple to, to get, get their storage. You think? Okay. Volume so do what? Volume discount. Well, I mean, yeah, but I think it was. I'm pretty sure their two hundred gig plan is like two dollars and ninety-nine cents a month. So it's not. It, it's it's always been roughly around that that speed. That plays. Uh, did something different in the fact that when you try to back up to them and the way they saved their cost was not on storage. The storage was cheap. It was their transit costs that were super expensive. So if you ever used the Backblaze client, you'd notice that your first gig that you were backing up was awesome. If you're going to back up 200 gig, you were backing up at like 200k a second for your last gig. OK. So much more information. And you know, on that, even if it is entirely viable to do, there are still many other methods that they would be capable of obtaining information. 
maybe they don't actually take it, right? This is one thing that I can say, I d haven't worked at any of these companies. I don't actually know what they are actually trying to get and or trying to sell. But in either case, I can go through many companies' privacy policies and say, well, all right, we've got an internet protocol because every site needs that even. If we're going to connect to them at all, they need an IP. If it's a date and time, well, they, to be honest, I don't know why you might need to record it, but they're going to get it somehow. Names of external drives, file types transferred, number of storage things. Yeah, these are all things that we would do because it's being backed up. Sensible, right? And then we go on to a further section and say, well, the information we are collecting from third parties. So first thing, right? <laughs> first thing, right? Um, optimizely, record user clicks. No idea why you'd need this, but all right. Hotjar, record where people move their mouse on, for keys on the web page. I'm going to ask the same question on how you can do as well with this, but say it is useful. And lastly, Google Analytics, because what site doesn't use Google Analytics these days? We have these three things. And the one thing that I actually want to point out here is the information that we collect from third parties, not necessarily from you. So where it might later say that will we distribute aggregate anonymized data, how are they anonymizing it? A lot, as I've heard at one point, Google Analytics is able to give you anonymized information. So clearly, Google Anal Analytics knows how to anonymize it. But the thing is, they're not getting that information directly from you. They're getting it from optimize the Hotjar Google Analytics. So it's being sent to their servers. They have the true information. They're not necessarily anonymize, an anonymizing it for their own use, but they will for whoever they're sending it to. Sounds nicer, right? So in this portion, it tells you it carries out other legitimate business purposes, such as to improve their products and services, as well as other lawful purposes about which we will notify the users and clients. And fair enough. Maybe that's all true, right? It's, it's probably legitimate. It's probably all legal. In fact, I'm pretty certain it is, or they probably wouldn't have stayed around as long. So that's accurate. Something I would like to ask is, how are they telling their clients of what's been changed? They'll notify their users, notify them, but it's not a, it is an opt-out process rather than opt-in. So if they change their terms of service, maybe they'll give you an email saying, we've changed how we're running things. We will now take, we will now observe this type of information, right? However, as, you, as I tend to find when I get those kinds of emails, it is a, hey, we've changed our terms of service. Click here to read it. I mean, most people don't read the terms of service to begin with, right? So how do we? Anyways. I read them and copy them and make a file. That's how geek I am. Will, will you? So I appreciate that, actually. But will you even reread all the bits in it to see what's changed, when it changed? Um, I copy the stuff, and I don't accept until I read them. Oh, OK. Because I've, I mean, there's some tricky TOUs yes. out there for yes. all kinds of stuff. And tell you stories, but I, I'm along with you. Mm -hmm. I'm serious about the Fair enough. Use, so Fair enough, enough. yes. So uh, similarly, if we were to look at what information that Backblaze shares, vendors, other third party providers, a little system providing things that are nice for the product. And I'm not going to go through this whole list. Point is, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and in the next portion, we can tell you that this is sort of how they're doing it. With, I'm pretty sure, B2 cloud storage is their type of storage. And in that, it says access information to content in other accounts, meaning, you know, for example, through APIs. And for any of those that are being used, any of the other services that are being used, you'll need to go through their policies as well to make sure that's good by your standards if you want to use their product and or their API if you're using it. But the thing is, if we were to go back here, I can point out that Facebook and Twitter and Slack are all on here. And I'm pretty sure with those, they'll just store a cookie in your computer. That cookie will keep you logged in no matter where you go as you browse. And so if you go to this site, Facebook knows that you've gone to Backblaze. 
and maybe knows if you're backing up, I, uh, depending on however they've implemented it in their API. So whatever their implementation, they're able to see that you've used backup software now. Sebastian, I know you read a lot more of these than I do because you actually read them, and I'll be one of the first to admit <laughs> that I don't generally take the time to, to be very careful about it. Sure. But that being said, this one seems pretty explicit in uh, what they're using and how compared yeah. to many that I've oh, seen. Oh, yeah. If we were to go into Facebooks, for example, right. it looks like they're doing a wonderful job of their privacy services. The thing that's difficult about it is if you were to go and try to find something about their terms of service that describes this particular thing, or even need to look at their business side, they do a very good job of obfuscating a large amount of the information. And so in terms of transparency, yeah, they actually do a very good job of that. And to the extent of, if I were to decide to use their service, I could probably figure out ways of keeping it relatively private for me, probably. But it's good to know all these things in it. And the point being, one privacy policy, here's a massive amount of information that it even tells us is going to be moved around to various places. So you know, in, in that sense, right and at the bottom of it, I forgot to mention, we disclose aggregate non-identifying information. Where do they get it? Is it from Google Analytics? Do they get it themselves? And if they do it themselves, do they actually sanitize it properly? <laughs> I hear a lot about places that screw up in properly anonymizing information to where it can't be, with many bits of information, reassociated. You know, maybe they do a good job. I don't actually know, but that's part of the point, right? We have no way of finding out aside from knowing people on the inside. Yeah. And I know people on the inside for several of those. Only one you've mentioned has a decent reputation. I was going to say, normally it's all uh, confined by NDAs at that point anyway. Yeah. But here's another question. Does anybody actually push cloud backup without PGP the guitar ball first? <laughs> Maybe they deserve it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just yeah. asking, like, well, I may only put my pictures up there, but they're still PGP, damn it. No, I mean, that, that's part of the question, right? When, when I read that, I was thinking, this is probably a full computer backup. Full computer, right? And as a result, unless we've full disk encrypted our drive, in which case, how are we using the software because it's on our computer? Because we, unless we've un unencrypted it to back it up, how are we? Well, you can, you can, so you can get to the encrypted version of your files even from within the unencrypted version because you can, you can uh, back up the block dev for the encrypted partition. Uh, and then any access to that won't be talking to unencrypted data. Great. In which case, I have an answer to how it could be done. Of which I mean, also would be saying. shell script to uh, move <laughs> tarballs around very effectively for you and get a GPG that you know backblaze can then upload. But here's the thing: how many Windows users use GPG and tarballs? I would say what they're Windows the users. They were asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> you would be lucky if they'd even know about seven zip. Oh, so, so last I checked, Sebastian, this was the Linux users. All right, so let me let me put that part aside and say, how about Macintosh users? Because that's who this was for, right? And to be fair, if they've got Bash, and it's so much closer to Linux, but well, not anymore to Gutsy Shell. That's true, actually. I did see that last time I went to an Apple store. You're right. So either way, it's closer to Linux. Might be more capable of doing it. I have a possible answer for how it would be done. So thank you for that. What I understand is a lot of modern uh, Mac users are terrified of the terminal. Yeah, I mean, but uh, the reason why I bring that up, though, is because some of my friends who are who use Macintosh or at least old machines, they're pretty content with using it because it's basically Bash. So yeah, I mean, valid. But you know, with all that in mind, though, we have all of our information everywhere now, right? So what's the what's the concern here? And I mean, that's, and that's, again, I'll go back to the other point and say, well, we can still get our privacy back. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is gone forever. It doesn't mean that we can't implement other practices to reobtain a certain amount of privacy. And the first places that I'm going to end up saying for how to do that, well, you go to the sites where they trade your data all over the place and opt out. 
I mean, they have an opt-in process. Personally, I don't approve of that anyways, but it's there. So if we were to go to a site like PQ, LexisNexis, Intellius, True People Search, they have opt-out sites for where you can either uh, remove your data from their service. Remove data might actually have to be an email or a call. Or you can get your information blacklisted so it's not something that's on a public search. So if you have it removed, I mean, better yet, right? Now if, it, now if any of these companies get breached, your data is not going to be in that repository of information. If we go on to the blacklisting it, well, it's, it may or may not be better for you because if you remove your data rather than blacklist it, it might come back. And you'd have to acknowledge that just because they removed it at one point doesn't mean they're not going to find it from someone else again. So as my suggestion would go, it what probably... probably if Because there's you know, two that have announced their own breaches, and I'm pretty sure there's a third that's going to Would you like me to ask, would, we, blah, would you like me to add the word again to it? Because, I mean, I can't say that for all of I'm them. I'm right? just throwing it out there, right? Lexus Nexus <laughs> <Texas admitted. laughs> So in either case, right? Like, that's... <laughs> when people are figuring out the dark net, it's just other people's computers in another way. It's like the cloud, right? It's just someone else's computer. So uh, if you were to get your data removed, you have that benefit. If it gets breached again, because they're probably going to swipe from that breach data, why not? It gives them profit. It's going to be brought back. Which one is more important to you? I'll leave that one up to you, because that one is a personal decision. One possible thought would be, though, if you blacklist it, change your, how you do your information, change how you distribute it, so that you don't necessarily get into these databases as easily. You can then remove it, and you're probably going to be at a better, in better shape by that point. So main places where they'll get your information is just accounts on, like, I don't know, Crunchyroll maybe, or like um, some, some Washington Post articles that are uh, the site that you want to get your newsletters from. Wherever that be from, some of the most common things that you'll have to provide for information to get an account would be email, phone number, probably maybe some card of payment. And that one is far more rare, but take AWS. If you want to make an account with them, you probably need a payment card. Nope. What was that? You don't need one to start. You need one to keep using it. So even you know, with the I don't think you can get your free T2 micro anymore without uh, yeah. I don't think you can without uh, get you off or pay to get a yeah. card. So so okay, if you mean use as in go to their site and make modifications to like permissions and stuff, maybe make make templates or something. There's a lot of things you can do for free. Okay. Google Cloud will give you a free year of their micro or a free year of cloud compute now too. Okay. To a certain, but you still have to give them a payment card yeah. before you ever can use it. So maybe you're right to some degree. When I last attempted to, they required a payment card before I had an, an account. So maybe to some degree, and I just didn't figure out the proper way of doing it. But even yeah, for an eight, for free. Cheap basket at the time, so. I think AWS does do a student one, though. Okay. AWS has a student one, yeah. And if, you, if your school provides you with credit, then you can make one without a card. But there will probably be lesser permissions on it still. So. I mean, Apple's actually made it very difficult to have an iCloud account without a card attached to it. You have to hit skip a number of times and in a very specific order before it will stop asking you for a payment card. There's a, a different method of doing it where if you were to purchase the phone and sign up online, that tends to make things less of a hassle, too. So making the account online. Let's talk about that. Like, if you order you order from BH Photo Video or another reseller, a MacBook Pro, right? It's delivered to your house. In order to update the OS, you have to have a, a, yeah, you know, right. an iCloud account, right. right? It's not an option. And it, there are like six or seven different places that you have to hit skip, and some of them are very hard to find in the fact that they're uh, almost the same color white as the background. 
type scenario. Like they make it very difficult to actually obtain an account without a payment card. They like the color gray. What can we say? <laughs> So those are the main methods, and as a result, those are going to be the main utilities that I'm going to tell you about how to develop in a more private way. And for one of my favorite services, it's 33Mail. They provide you with forwarding addresses. And the way that it will work is you make an account, you'll have a username, and it's a catch-all email. So it'll be thing, whatever you want it to be, at whatever your username is, dot 33Mail.com. So provide uh, whatever service, like say you want to go to Crunchyroll and watch some anime. To be, fa to be fair, I don't know if it works, but say you want to do this, you'll provide thing, whatever it is, maybe anime at um, cooldude.33mail.com. Now, to be fair, this is more of an obfuscation thing, right? Because most services are automated. They're probably not checking for if this portion of the domain is the same, if this subdomain is the same. What they're normally checking for is, is the start of it the same, and is this domain maybe the same, depending on the service. So if we provide that to Crunchyroll, it's going to be its own email address. Since it is a catch-all, it doesn't matter what thing is, and it will go to whatever email you're forwarding it to. So provide as many as you want, as many accounts as you want, there's also the downside of, because this is how this works, it, on some sites, is not trusted. So say we're going to make a Minecraft account. And I say this mostly because Microsoft works this way. If you were to make a Minecraft account and you put in a 33 mail domain, they won't trust 33 mail domains because we need you to be able to reply to these emails if needed. OK, that's fair. The problem being is that's still inaccurate because you can pay for the service and then have the ability to reply. You have to pay for the service like $12 a year or something, something a month, I don't know. But you have the capability to, it's just most people use it for a different purpose. Because since you have this many possible emails that most places don't check for, people will use it for DDoS attacks. People will stop trusting it. So for where it does work, it is a wonderful tool to be using. If we need something such as a more trusted domain or just simply more private email, and we don't necessarily need the forwarding aspect of it, we can still go to something like Proton Mail, Tutanota, FastMail, make an email, put in a password. We don't need anything else prior. They'd recommend it because, all right, good for security, but, uh, and by security, I mean recovery, but. Otherwise, they don't require it of their users when they're making an account. So Proton Mail, Tutanota, the things that they provide that a lot of places like would be their GPG encryption of their emails automatically. But the thing is, it's only between other users of the same service. So if we decide we want to send a email to someone at servicenow.com, and we're using a Proton Mail address, or even if we're going Proton Mail to Tutanota, they don't use the same system to encrypt their messages. So it's going to have to go, just like every other email, in clear text. The um, reason why I have fast mail here, though, is because these are nice. You know, we can't, even the companies can't necessarily see the messages that you're sending if it's going in between the same service. But since most people will be sending emails to many places, to many different domains, they don't have the encryption. And as a result, it's far cheaper. But the thing is, it's still paid. The other two aren't necessarily paid. If you want to get more out of your account, you'll, you'll have to pay for those. But Tutanota, Proton Mail, otherwise are uh, free for, I'm pretty sure, permanently free for like 5 megabytes or something. If one of you guys know it, correct me, but it's something like that. For fast mail, it is you have to pay for it. But at least in their case, I know that they're not scanning the emails that I'm sending out. At least in their case, I know that I have to put my email in a certain place to make it easy for support to see my messages. It's just not easy otherwise. But if I were to go to Google, they provide a great free service. And most places that I know actually totally use Gmail. But they do scan your email for 
maybe something like malware or some other type of information, but the point being, they'll even scan the emails you send because it has valuable marketing information in it. So if we want something that is cheaper and definitely going to be more private, a fast mail is a fair option. Going on to the second thing that we would be using to make accounts is simply, so in reality, this is really going to be phone numbers. But the reason why I say burner phone numbers is because all the ones I'm going to mention have a burn function in them. Meaning, if you don't want this phone number anymore, you can burn it. And whatever data was previously associated with it uh, on your device is not necessarily going to be there. So my pseudo. One great example of a, a, a privacy-based product application that's only available on iOS currently. As far as I know, they're developing for web right now, but currently only on iOS. It'll provide you with a alias name. It'll provide you with a photo for whatever the name is, a phone number, most importantly, and email. Anything more, I'll be perfectly honest, I don't quite remember. But you'll get like three of those sets of things for paying for it. You get a phone number. And usually, that phone number is accepted in most places whenever they're asking for one for an account. Better yet, you're able to pick up the phone if they send you a call or if they send you a text message. You can pick it up. Similarly, for Android, a different application which doesn't have all those features would be something like Burner App. If we were to take Burner App, get a phone number off of it, we can send text to it. But one thing to keep in mind, right? is that those messages are going to be sent to either the company that has it, or maybe if it's a burner phone that you've literally purchased a SIM card for and whatever else, it might be going to the uh, carrier provider, and they're able to see the messages you're sending. So how do we get around that? How do we get around them seeing that kind of information? You can use something like Signal, where if you want to use your phone number, can put in your phone number. You have encrypted text messaging. And now whoever your carrier is, since you're not using their app anymore in reality, they're not necessarily able to snoop on whatever you're sending your girlfriend at that time. Alternatively, you don't want to give out a phone number because, well, that's private information. Why would I want to just hand out my phone number to someone? I still want to communicate with them. Different option is wire. If you remember the 33 mail addresses I talked about, Wire will accept those. All we need to do is make an account with them using, say, a 33 mail account, ask for a password, and you have whatever username you want to communicate with people on. Uh, similarly, it is end-to-end -end encrypted, and their form of getting payment from people is when it becomes large enough, you will need to pay to get a uh, group subscription for it. Last one I want to talk to you guys about is Jammy, though. This one's a project by GNU. And, and in their case, I really don't know how they do this. And I kind of want someone to communicate on it with so that I can understand, so I can care to figure out it better. But supposedly, their communication is end-to-end -end encrypted, just like the previous two. And supposedly, it is decentralized. So we don't need to send it to a central server. We don't need to send it to Signal server first, or we don't need to send it to Wires servers first. It'll either hop through other people's applications to get to you, or some other method. I, like I said, decentralized. I have no idea how they do it. So there are some cloud replacement services that are popping up uh, that are also decentralized. It could be there. They're using some kind of broadcast system, sort of like uh, what they use for BitTorrent. Well, so is that with cellular, or is it over uh, Wi-Fi? I haven't. This is the first I've heard of this system. It, it uses yeah. DHT, distributed hash um, tables, which is the same protocol that BitTorrent uses. Oh, OK. Well, so yeah, OK. So if that's the method of doing it, I'm not, I'm not the one programming it. I'm more the one to implement the system rather than to create it. So I'll go with it and say, I mean, it sounds much better than even needing to give an email or a phone number. They'll just let me make an account with whatever username. It's sort of like PGP if you have uh, the whole yeah. chain just published. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Favorable in my mind, at least. And the last thing that, you know, like AWS. 
how are you going to get around them needing your card name and needing, uh, sorry, your card's number and your name on it, and as a result, probably your address, right? One option, privacy.com. Uh, they'll provide you with a service that here's a card, here's a name on it, you choose the name. It could even be Davies Bikes for all I care, right? Um, it'll provide you with whatever the numbers for it is, select the amount, whatever the service is, and you'll have a masked credit card to use elsewhere without needing to provide even your actual address because they'll take whatever address even. So when you're sharing your card, you're not sharing your name, you're not sharing your address, or maybe you are, that's part's up to you really. But then there's a large question when a lot of people start signing up for it. And that's largely a, well, why do they need my bank's username and password? I mean, wasn't the whole point of this application to not share more of my private information? They can't because they fall under the Know Your Customer regulation. They There's can. no way that you can have a credit card where the back end does not know who you are. Yeah. And, like, it's yes. It, yes, you do need, that, and that's part of the point, right? They need to ask for it because they need to have the cap they need to have that ability to know who you are. Because yeah, financial like transactions... Like, or like, the know your customer and yeah. money laundering. Mm -hmm. off, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. You, you get hosed quick so, with that. And so as a result, they totally need it. But as this FAQ is pointing out, yeah, they need it, but they don't necessarily store that after using an API called Plaid, of which will provide them a token to access your bank account. So, you know, whether or not you trust Plaid, that part's up to you. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. I know that they are used by other banks. I'm pretty sure Bank of America is one of them. Maybe, yeah, Citibank, American Express, Venmo, uh, you don't trust how they do things, fair enough. Um, don't provide it and use however method, probably cash by this point, to make purchases. Point is, privacy.com, valid option if you are comfortable with providing this information. Similar alternative, similar to pseudo, except having mass credit cards as well, is Blur by Abbine, Abine. Incorporated. In their case, it is a paid service. You'll need to pay for the ability to get unlimited mass credit cards. You'll need to pay for the ability to get certain domain names to get emails from, and they'll even get you a forwarding phone number. So if you get, if you need to put in a phone number somewhere, it'll forward it to your phone. So when you give the company a phone number, it's not yours. It'll allow for text. It'll allow for calls. Can be gotten rid of whenever you choose. And if you um, try it with this type of email instead of a 33 email, as I hear, this one tends to be more successful under, those, under the circumstances when they don't trust emails. So with all this information, right, if you were to go back and opt out of all the things or even choose to remove your data from those databases and you use these products, one of the main things that they choose to search for is um, verifiable data, meaning has it been used in various places and thus can be to some degree trusted that it is true information. And in reality, if we decide that we want to make it not, who knows who you are? And depending on how well you guys are feeling about it, I'm I, I'll ask you guys, right? I have made a post recently pertaining to privacy and, you know, large data, sci data scientists need large amounts of information. So if you guys want to hear about a conundrum, a somewhat dilemma that I've run into when dealing in privacy and talking to people in AI, I'll tell you guys about it if you like. Who would care to hear about it? Okay, I'll go over to it. So, as I previously mentioned to some degree, privacy in general will protect the general people. The less information that is out in the public, we don't necessarily, we won't need to worry about as much getting stolen and thus being used for other purposes. 
If uh, you're someone who needs less of your information to be out of public sight, you might only be worried about fishers. You might only be worried about robocallers or just the common day automated hacker, right? Because when it comes to hacking, there are people who made programs which will automatically do it to whatever device is vulnerable. Maybe you're a CEO and you need to protect your personal information from more advanced hackers and or to keep company secrets. One of the easiest places to define where this might be at is China has a lot of stuff that they steal from America. You might be wanting to protect your company secrets if you are uh, if you have a top, a, um, something like a secret recipe, right? Intellectual, Intellectual property. It is that, but no, it's a, it's a company secret? What's the proper term? It's a lawful, say again? Trade secret. Trade, trade secret. secret. That, yeah, and that was the term. Yeah. So maybe you have a trade secret that you don't want being released. Because you want to keep getting as much money off of that idea as you, as, as you can. Or a separate thing, where you might be the average Joe Schmo on the street, but one day you've found yourself with a girlfriend, and you're happy with her for a while. But eventually, you run into her actually being kind of crazy, and she seems to know all of the things I tell people, and thus where you've been working, and or whatever other information they're able to obtain on you. If you decide you don't want to be near that person anymore, you probably want to be, uh, you probably don't want that information to be public. Because if they're absolutely enamored, unless you can change them somehow, you need to hide yourself. And a good example of a problem like this, and it's not entirely related in this case, but a, um, someone who is a pop star in Japan, I believe, something like that, sent, posts a picture of her, and in the picture you can see in the reflection of her eyeball a train station that is where she tends to get off. And there's enough information for the person who is absolutely enamored by that person, by the uh, pop star, and he's able to look into that eye, see that that is the train station, and as a result, he can go there at one point. Um, at one point, he went there, saw that she came out of that train station, uh, put whatever over her mouth, and groped her. So there are various methods of doing it. The question is, is what to what degree are you worried about it? She was probably not worried about something in her eyeball, but might be something you should be, depending on who you are. When you go to a company, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily trying to be nefarious. Whoever's working there isn't necessarily a bad person because they're doing work for this company. And in large cases, if they are gathering information from you, it's probably going to be in, a, in an automated fashion. They'll find out that you are running Linux, and they'll find out that you're running this type of browser. And it can all be done automatically. But as a result, there is massive amounts of data in there. And which one of these are important to you? Similarly, based on all of these, uh, all the examples I've given, it's something called a threat model. What does your threat model look like? Is it you have great concern for someone who's going to be hacking into my machine, machine? Do you have great concern for someone just finding where I am? And they'll give you a very good layout of what kind of things you should be uh, trying to keep private. But then we go into the area of data science. And I have some friends who do work in data science in general. And the main thing that I'm going to bring up is machine learning, people who do machine learning in AI, um, a different subset of it which requires massive amounts of data. And by that I mean massive amounts of information to try to identify uh, how something works or what something looks like. Um, I mean, earlier today, I was at a conference where they were talking about using deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. 
as, I, as it was described, for Go players, um, it might have taken a while, but they were able to train the machine with enough data to be able to beat some, who, the uh, greatest Go player on the planet. And Go being a uh, Chinese sort of like chess, but also not really. It, it's a board game. Is it Japanese? Yeah, so the, and the name for it, thank you, is DeepMind. Um, but in either case, they need massive amounts of data to get it to be accurate. Because if we have Strictly all Japanese, of this information about, here's a person who is wearing a tie. Is this person a male or a female? Okay, well, we, we can tell based on all the previous photos we have, which were all males, and furthermore, all males in suits, that this person is a male. Except when a female walks over with a suit and tie, she's also a male. But clearly she's not. There's faults in the process, but they need much more data, and they need much more variance of that data to get something accurate with their machine. So the two main as, as I hear, the two main competitors in this area is China and the United States. Most of the time when I hear a conversation about this, it'll be the United States has the better data scientist, has the better algorithms, knows how to create it better, generally. But then we go to China, and they simply have far more data to work with. So. They'll have mass surveillance utilities which will record that information and now can be used by whatever their data science division in their government might be. And now they've got far more data to work with to get far more accurate machine learning uh, outcomes. And so the question really becomes, what's more important? Is having the better data scientists more important or is it more important to have more data? And that's kind of where I have, that's the extent of what I've heard. I've not heard of an uh, answer to which one is truly more important or to what degree which one needs to be better to be better. It's between America and China as far as I'm aware though. And for most people, this is rather concerning. So that brings up a question, right? If we want to have better technology than the Chinese, if we in America want better technology than the Chinese, can we have as much privacy? And to my answer, yeah, those of us who want it can probably have it, but will our um, data sets be as good as those in China? And to what degree will it matter? So maybe you're the kind of person who wants to have a private life. And as a result, I'll be here. I'll teach you the various methods of preventing your information from clearly going onto the internet. I'll help you hide from the internet. But then if you are more concerned about China and how good their machines and technology are, maybe you don't care as much about sharing what type of hardware you're using or what type of OS. So it's useful to data scientists. We have less of it because we don't have mass surveillance in our country. <laughs> and I'll say most people are probably pretty grateful for this. And I'll say I am. Because at least in America, we have the ability to recover our information. Whereas in China, not necessarily. But at least here, I can teach people how to get it back, even if they didn't at one point want it. So thank you.